The other day when we were making the double caliper, I commented that I didn't really have the right rivet setter for the 3 8 diameter rivet. And that's just because I'm using a commercially made 3 8 diameter rivet with a round head. If you make your own rivets, you can make your heads any size and shape you want to. But I don't have a header that's exactly this size. I've got one that's close, and I may have made that for doing my own 3 8 rivets, but it just doesn't fit these commercially made rivets that I have. So I thought I would make a new set of rivet setters. At least one bottom rivet setting tool and one top rivet setting tool. Unfortunately, to do that efficiently, I like to use ball punches. And I'll try and explain that when we actually get to making the rivet header why I like ball punches instead of some of the other options that are available out there. But in spite of the fact that I have a whole bunch of ball punches, I don't have one that is exactly the size of the 3 8 rivet head. So today, let's make a ball punch so that later we can make the rivet heading tools. Now a ball punch is really nothing more than a ball shape on the end of a handle so that you can drive it into a piece of steel. Great big ones can be made out of ball bearings and this works really well, but welding little tiny ball bearings onto the end of a shaft gets a little bit problematic. This is about as small as I would like to go with a ball bearing style ball punch. I made this one probably 30 years ago. It's actually brazed on there instead of welded on because that was the technology I had at the time. And it's just a mild steel handle and I've been using it for, like I say, about 30 years. But it's too big for what I want. My next biggest one is too small for what I want. And the way to figure out what you want is start with the rivet. If you're using these for rivets, these are useful for a whole lot of other applications. Then I just set a pair of calipers to the diameter of that rivet head. It doesn't matter what the diameter is, just set it to the diameter of the rivet head. I'm not even going to read the number there, it is completely irrelevant. I'm just going to use that as a guide now for making my ball punch. And this one, like I say, is way too small. This one is too big. So what I have is a piece of steel that is a little bit too big. So this has plenty of material to make my ball punch out of. I've cut it to a comfortable length to hold in my hand. And this is old sucker rod. And even though we've explained sucker rod on this channel many times before, somebody's gonna ask, what is sucker rod? Sucker rod is the connecting rod that goes from an above ground wellhead to an underground pump. Frequently they're used in the oil industry. You see these big jack pumps look like a giant insect out on the prairie pumping away. The sucker rod is what connects that pump head to the pump down in the hole. It's not available in all parts of the world. If you're in an oil producing area, you probably have sucker rod, but it is also used in other types of wells like water wells. So you may have it around. Doesn't really matter. There's nothing special about it. It tends to be 4130, 4140. If you don't have sucker rod, buy 4130 or 4140. I frequently make these out of S7 because I like S7, but I don't happen to have any S7 this size on hand. The only thing I have is a little bit too small. And because these tools don't need to have a good sharp cutting edge, they aren't a punch for punching all the way through, they don't need to be real crisp, you don't really need a very high-tech steel. The sucker rod, even though I don't know exactly what it is, is going to be just fine. I will let it air cool to normalize and see if it gets hard. I've never seen air hardening sucker rod, but we'll do that anyways just to find out. And then we'll probably quench it in oil because most sucker rod tends to harden pretty well in oil. But enough of that. We'll talk more about that when we get to that stage. The forging steps are really simple on this, so let's go do what little forging there is in making a ball punch. Then we'll finish the tool. Now instead of using the little dial caliper while we're forging, I just set one side of our double caliper to the rivet head size. That way I don't get my good dial caliper hot. I don't need to reduce this by much, so I just need a short taper on the end, or a slight taper I should say. I'll bring it back a ways just to make for a smooth transition. And I'm going to go square, and then octagon, and then round it up. Let's see if I'm about the right size. 
It's just a hair under size. I'll grind it back until I get to the right size. And that, sadly, is all of the actual forging that this tool is going to need. So we're going to heat it back up again and then we're going to let it air cool or normalize. Now if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know that I am a real advocate for precise heat treating, but we're going to do this one just using the forge and very simple methods today just to show that that does still work. And there is certainly nothing wrong with using these simple heat treating methods. I just prefer the more precise control that I can get by using an electronic heat treat oven. Otherwise, everything is just a little bit of a guessing game. And the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. There's certainly nothing wrong with it. Don't feel like you can't make tools because you don't have a fancy electronic heat treating oven. That's just my preference, especially if I'm making tools that are going out to customers. I really want to know that I can get consistent, repeatable results. For tools like this that I use in the shop, it just really isn't that big a deal. So right now we're letting it normalize. It's just bringing it up above critical temperature and letting it air cool. For steels that are not air hardening, so oil hardening steels or water hardening steels, normalizing is a good way to reduce stress and reduce grain growth. Typically I would prefer to go ahead and put it in vermiculite, that cools a little bit slower, it's more like annealing, although it's not exactly the same as annealing, and those terms tend to get a little bit confused sometimes. But by cooling it slowly, it helps de-stress it, it's going to be less likely to crack, it's going to be a little bit softer to file or grind depending on how you need to shape the tool, and your tool will last longer and perform better in the long run. Now just in case this is air hardening steel, as soon as this is cool enough to handle again, I'll check it with a file and see if it actually got hard by cooling it in air. If it got hard, then it's air hardening steel, then it is air hardening steel, and you can't normalize air hardening steel. But my experience with this batch of sucker rock is that it is typically oil hardening steel. So after it's normalized, then I'll take it to the grinder and I'll grind the profile that I want on it, clean it up a little bit there, and then we'll go into the hardening and tempering phase. Well, this is cooled enough to handle, and it files quite easily, so it is definitely not an air hardening steel, which I didn't think it would be. And you can do all this with a file, or you can do it with a grinder. In the long run, the goal, though, is to make this match this. You're just going to have to do the best you can. And there are other ways you could approach this. If you could find a round swedge, perhaps a rivet header that's actually the correct size, which if I had that, I wouldn't be making this tool, then you could drive this into that rivet header, and that would round this up quite nicely. But since I don't have the rivet header, and I need this tool to make the rivet header, and I don't have a ball swedge that's really quite this size, I'm just going to file this and do the best I can by eye, or you can go to the grinder. Actually, I think I will go to the grinder because it'll only take me a few seconds to grind this. Well, this is very close to what I want now. I'll do a little bit more grinding and polishing after it's all heat treated, but this gets us real close so I don't have to do so much after I've hardened and tempered it. I've taken it down to a 220 finish so there's no coarse scratch marks, and that helps reduce the chance of stress risers which could lead to cracks. Now because this is oil hardening steel and because it's cold in the shop, I'm going to first preheat my oil, then we'll bring this up to temperature, we'll harden and temper it, I'm not going to worry about hardening and tempering the struck end. It's going to need to be, that means it will deform, it'll mushroom a little bit, and it'll need to be dressed and ground, but it's not going to chip and crack and it's not going to hurt my hammer if I just leave this soft. I'm only going to harden about this much of the end. Well, I have my oil preheated. I just use a big bar, heat it up to just a dull red, and then I put it in my quench bucket and let it sit till it cools off pretty well. And that's generally okay. You can check it with a thermometer if you want to, but it should be too hot to put your hand in, so don't check it with your finger. 
So the next thing I want to do is bring this up to a cherry red. I don't really want it in the high orange range at all. That's too hot for most steels. I don't know what the exact critical temperature for this is. That's part of the problem with using salvage steels. You're doing some guesswork, but for a tool like this, I don't think it's all that critical. We're going to quench about the last inch of this in the oil, leaving another inch or two still at that red heat. I will then clean up the part we quenched with a flap disc on an angle grinder so that it's shiny and we can then watch the temper colors run. And as soon as this gets into the peacock range, maybe purple, something like that, then I'll go ahead and quench it. Even if it goes to blue range, it's still going to be harder than a piece of mild steel. And for a ball punch, that's plenty hard enough. Now, even though I don't want to quench and harden this part, I'm going to start heating there just so I get a good even heat all the way through this. I probably won't bring that up high enough to harden anyways. I have the gas forge turned down pretty low. And I will periodically turn the forge off and just let it soak in the hot forge and come up to heat as slowly and evenly as possible. That's real important. And the larger the piece is, the slower you have to bring it up to heat and the longer you need to let it soak. So that's just showing the very dullest of red. I'll turn it around and put the end we really want hot back in there. And the same thing. I'll turn it off and let it sit and soak. Now just a quick word of caution with regard to judging color temperatures. Don't judge color in your shop based on what you see on videos. The colors will look different in your shop based on the ambient light in your shop, the way your eye perceives color, and the way my camera or your computer monitor all perceive color. The colors you're seeing on this video may look hotter or they may look colder than what I see in person. Every camera is a little bit different. Every computer monitor or TV screen that you're watching on is a little bit different. The lighting in the room while you're watching it's going to make it look different. The angle that you're looking at the screen is going to make it look different. There are so many variables that you cannot trust the incandescent colors in the red and the orange range to be accurate with what you would see in your forge for the same colors. So you need to do some trial and error. You need to do some experimentation. Working with another more experienced smith is an ideal way to learn what color you're looking for. And all of that needs to happen in your shop, and you can't learn it just from watching a video. I can describe it as best I can, but the way I describe it may not be the way you perceive it. So learn to judge color in your shop. And having said that, we're just going to come, we're coming up to a dull red. This is still magnetic, and magnetic's another one of those things that isn't completely reliable. Some steels need to be much hotter than magnetic, and some just need to be a little hotter than magnetic. So again, you have to learn your steels. That's just about what I want. possibly get it. Move it up and down in the oil. I have a five gallon metal bucket of oil inside of a ten gallon oily rag bucket. And that way, if it catches fire, all I have to do is let go of the foot pedal and it slams the lid and puts the fire out. But you want to keep it moving both to keep air pockets from forming as the oil boils around it, but also it keeps from having a sharp line where it changes from quenched to not quenched. Because if you do that, that might be a place it would crack. You want to get this cleaned up so you can watch the colors run. See the colors running quite quickly here.
Hopefully you can see this on camera. This is blue up in here, peacock, bronze, kind of straw here, just barely starting to change colors down here. We want to let that bronze to peacock color get right down into here. And this may take a little while, depending on how much heat you have up here. But then when, you, when this is right, then we're going to quench it again. And it's getting really close. And again, these colors may not look exactly right on the camera, but these are probably more accurate than the incandescent colors because you're not dealing with something that's actually putting out light. So this is what I would call the bronze color. Right here is what I would call peacock. And here is dark blue, then light blue, and then it starts to turn kind of a gray up here. And you can find charts. There are all sorts of charts online and in books that tell you what these colors represent. So that's starting to turn into that peacock. I'm going to quench it. This time I'm quenching the entire tool. And that should be ready to polish up and then we can use it. So that's really a pretty quick, simple tool. It took longer to bring it up to heat and watch the tempering colors run than it actually took to forge it and grind it. And of course it took longer for it to air cool and normalize. All total, I have about two hours into this tool, but a lot of that time is waiting for it to do things. It probably took an hour just to air cool during the normalizing so that I could actually handle it again. And I did other things during that time. So perhaps I actually have an hour's worth of work into the tool. I'm gonna to go ahead and do the final grinding and polishing on this between videos. And the next time we see this tool, we'll be making the rivet headers we need. And hopefully this will make just the right rivet header. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button. Feel free to take some time, watch a few of the other videos, share the videos with your friends, but then by all means, get out to your shop, make something, but stay safe, wear your safety glasses. We'll see you for the next one.